I'm Kip Davis, a biblical scholar and a specialist in the Dead Sea Scrolls and early Judaism. So I'm doing something a little different today. Most of my focus is set on doing good critical biblical study and on countering bad apologetic arguments which stem from the Bible. Because I am a scholar committed to confronting poor or misleading scholarship, I felt it necessary to put together this video here. Last week, I was watching a Q&A stream on the channel Ancient Egypt and the Bible, which is owned and operated by Dr. David A. Falk, an Egyptologist who has often ventured into the topics of biblical studies. Dr. Falk is a PhD graduate from the University of Liverpool, and he most recently held a postdoc position at the Vancouver School of Theology, located on the campus of the University of British Columbia. I assume that when it comes to Egyptian history, culture, and texts, Dr. Falk knows what he's talking about and is possibly a good resource on these topics. I honestly don't really know because I know barely anything about Egyptology. But when it comes to the Bible, I'm afraid that Dr. Falk's promoted expertise is not much more convincing than any number of Christian apologists that I see regularly on YouTube. And that brings us to today's video. I am really pleased to be joined by two other experts, Dr. Josh Bowen from Digital Hammurabi and Dr. Dan McClellan of widespread TikTok and Twitter fame. Gentlemen, welcome. Oh, well, thank you for the uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm Dan McClellan. I uh, hold a PhD in theology of religion from the University of Exeter, where I wrote my dissertation on the conceptualization of deity in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, I work currently as a scripture translation supervisor for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and occasionally adjunct teach coursework. I am also, uh, I have a TikTok channel where I work on democratizing uh, scholarly knowledge and resources and try to help people's concerns as they navigate public discourse about academic approaches to the Bible and religion. And I am uh, Dr. Josh. I have a PhD from Johns Hopkins University uh, in Assyriology with a minor in Hebrew Bible. I got a master's in theology from Capital Bible Seminary, uh, where I focused in on Hebrew and other Semitic languages. Um, you know, with that being said, you know, when I come into the realm of the Hebrew Bible, even though I, I feel like I have a fair amount of training in it, um, I am... I am reticent to say this is my specific area of expertise that I'm dealing in. Um, and so you will, if anybody knows me, they will. And then my motto is this isn't my specific area of expertise, but let me tell you what scholars say about this. So I feel like that's sort of my modus operandi here on YouTube and social media is to be a conduit of sorts to uh, what it is that the experts in these relevant uh, you know areas of the field say. Um, so hopefully that's what we'll be doing today. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, before we start, I think it's worthwhile to point out that while all three of us are trained biblical scholars, each of us approaches the text from a different uh, field of specialization. All three of us also hold uh, differing religious commitments. So I want viewers to notice that even despite these individual commitments, all three of us see the same problems in Dr. Falk's approach. And we hold many of the same views with regards to the history, the origins, and the development of the biblical text. Together, we're going to watch and listen to two questions from Dr. Falk's video and his responses to these. And we're going to point out what is especially problematic in how he handles these. Okay, let's take a look at this uh, first question, which deals with uh, slavery in the Old Testament. I'll start at verse 20. And if a man strikes his male or female servant with a rod and he dies at his hand, he shall be punished. If, however, he survives a day or two, 
No vengeance shall be taken, for he is his property. Okay. Um, the meaning here for property is, the word here for property in Hebrew is kesef. And it's the general meaning is um, um, silver. Now, the second part of this question is, any thoughts on beatings and slavery in Old Testament in general? Every culture that ever had slaves, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we are talking about, say, uh, the most ancient cultures in the ancient Near East that had slaves, or, say, modern slavery today, whether you're talking about factory slavery or, say, penal slavery. We have to understand that America does still practice slavery today. We practice it in our penal system, where, you know, people are chained in chain gangs and marched out onto the streets of Georgia and do road work at the side of the road. If I could just pause it here. One of the things that I, I thought when I saw this part, um, and I apologize for the kids in the background, um, is that we, we have to be careful with definitions. And this it, slavery is one of these things that's just incredibly difficult, particularly when we're talking about uh, slavery in the ancient Near East and in the Hebrew Bible, because there's you have one word for it, right? Not not you know, one main word, right? Evid, and um, you know because of that, uh, there th there's a, a great many contexts in which this word appears, and so there's you know there's a wide range of meanings that this word Evid can take, and because it's already incredibly complex on that level, when you start to make connections to modern society, it becomes even more tenuous, right? And, and one of the problems that I see, and, and not that you can't do it, not that you can't make those connections, I absolutely think that you can, but what I think we need to be very precise about is what is similar about the institutions that we're talking about and what is different I don't necessarily want to spend any time really pushing back on this, but just in general, um, like we would want to ask ourselves the question, what is it about the penal system? Uh, not that it's my area of expertise, but what is it about the modern penal system uh, that is slave-like, right? That, that, that sort of um, resembles slavery in the ancient Near East. And then in what ways is it very different? Um, and I think those are really important factors to consider when we're trying to talk about answering the question of slavery in the Hebrew Bible and in the ancient Near East. Hey, is is that still a thing? Is there, you'll forgive me because I'm from Canada and I don't really know anything, um, but is is that still a thing, chain gangs in, in Georgia? I'm not sure. <laughs> it's, not, it's not my area. Um, <laughs> But the problem that I see with this, just, just to give an example of what I mean, like there's a very big difference between uh, somebody being incarcerated. And uh, listen, like I, 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 I suspect having worked uh, in, the, you know, in, the, in the jail uh, as a chaplain for seven years, there's some real problems, right, with our jail system. I'm not making any kind of a... a a critique or any type type of commentary on what's good or bad about the um, you know the penal system, but what I, what I would say is there are differences between the idea of someone commits a crime and they're put in jail and they lose their freedom for a set period of time. There's a difference between that and what we see uh, in in for example debt slavery or chattel slavery. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible, those things are just different. And we have to be nuanced about it, I think, because when you start to say things, I hear this in apologetics all the time, when somebody says something like, oh, well, it's not so different from, often what that's doing is we say, well, we, we're in favor of, you know, if, if the audience says, oh, I'm in favor of jail for people, well, then it's, you know, I guess it's not so bad. And I'm not suggesting that that's what Dr. Falk is doing here. It may be, I don't know, um, but that's where I think we have to be careful. Maybe it's before we before we continue. Maybe uh, I, I think it's worth pointing out if uh, if you don't already know, uh, Doctor Josh has written a book 
about slavery. So it's it's something that he has he has at least thought quite a bit about and read quite a bit about and really done the legwork on this. So um, everybody, if nothing else, you should go and uh, and buy this book. In all cases, if a slave refuses to to work, beating has always been seen or some sort of punishment has been seen as the normal punishment. This is um, the whole the whole Kesef property is 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 silver. It's um, it's just general. It's a general term for property in general. So that's that's not a big deal here. But a slave only remains the property of the slave owner in uh, Hebrew law for as long as the um, the slave is a pagan. As soon if if, a, if the slave somehow can um, converts to Yahweh worship or becoming a Jew, then he's no longer property. He's he's a brother, and at that point, um, say the property aspect of slavery ends, and then it becomes he 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 becomes free at the time of jubilee. Okay. Okay. Anybody, so this was. Yeah, you know, I was going to ask if anybody has any idea, um, where this is coming from, because. I don't recognize it. I mean, you know, the, the, certainly by a certain point, you know, during the rabbinic period, again, now we're leaving my, certainly leaving my area of expertise, but, you know, like the, the term ger, the resident alien, it goes through some changes, right? People have written extensively about this, um, even quite recently. And, uh, you know, so by the time you get into the rabbinic period, Gair has sort of taken on this idea of proselyte, right? It's a sort of a developing thing. Um, and if people are interested in that, please contact me and I can get you the secondary literature on it. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not, it seems like there's a little bit of conflation going on between different areas of the, the law collection here. And I may be wrong, but that's just how it's coming across to me. Um, there's no question that there's a significant amount of debate about this passage, Exodus 21, 20 to 21, is is debated. If you read through Gary, uh, Gregory Kirikinyo's book, he he's often cited in this regard because he lays it out, the d debate the, the debate out pretty clearly. Is this talking about uh, an Israelite dead slave or is this talking about a foreign chattel slave? And there's not a lot of you know uniformity on this. I tend to think, and most, many of the scholars that, that I've read on this tend to think, tend to lean toward uh, this talking about um, an Israelite debt slave, right? Um, and so that's that's significant. Uh, it tends to mirror what we see in the laws of Hammurabi and the laws of Eshnuna um, and in, in, in other places, not exactly the same, uh, but that sort of the legal rationale is the same. So if you look at the laws of Hammurabi, I think it's like one, 14, 115, 116, somewhere around there. You know, the, the laws are discussing if somebody takes a distrainee um, or a, a pledge and uh, that person is abused. Uh, well, if they're not abused, uh, they just die naturally. Uh, well, then there's no there's no cause for a claim. Can't raise a claim against the, 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 the master who is holding that pledge or that distrainee. Uh, however, if there's abuse, and the individual dies, then there's, you know, uh, either capital punishment or if it was a slave that was taken as a pledge, then there's a monetary payment for the value of that slave. So it's, you know, r roughly the same, right? Um, again, some some differences, but the idea is the same. But if this is a debt slave, which, again, I'd say probably most scholars would say that it is, then this the use of the term kesev here. Uh, is is actually kind of telling because during the period of their debt servitude, that's that's what they're considered, right? That's the term that's being used, um, and that makes sense in this context because they're treated much more like, uh, you know, this is this is uh, like family law as opposed to uh, property law. If you go later in the chapter with the Goring Ox incident, you, the slave falls much more under property law. The slave is killed, and there's a you know monetary payment that's made to the owner of the slave, and you, you know, that's 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 the end of it. Um, here, if the slave is killed, again, I think it's by abuse. Uh, 
you know, then, then you have uh, malice involved and now there's, uh, you know, the Hebrew term here is nakam. It probably means uh, the death penalty. If not the death penalty, it seems like it's pretty severe, but I think it probably is the death penalty. And so that seems to fall more under family law, right? Something that's, you know, treating that slave much more as a person than as property. So I, I, I take issue with this idea that, you know, they're, they're not considered in some way, some aspect of property. Certainly they're not considered property in the sense of chattel. And if that's what he means, then I agree. Um, but that I don't think that's what's being described here. Um, you know, legally speaking, that person is under su the, the subjection of the master until the end of the six years and, th and then they're released. But during that period, you know, the, the, they're a slave to the master. So the Jubilee comes from Leviticus 25, which is a, it's a completely different concept, uh, what's going on there that we can talk about, but I've talked a lot, so I should stop. And I, I would raise one of my concerns when I see discussions like this is there is an attempt to a tacit kind of harmonization of all these texts as if they all reflect a single reality when they are coming from different time periods written by different people for different reasons with different rhetorical goals. And we can't just assume that this represents a one-to-one -one relationship with what was actually going on. I think the Goring Ox is a famous story about something that probably didn't really happen, but was a, an illustration of, look how sophisticated, organized, and just our society is. And this is more performative mm -hmm. jurisprudence than these things keep happening. We need to make rules for them. And to gloss over the fact that the covenant code is coming from a completely different time, place, and concern than, um, the text in Leviticus and treat them as if we can um, harmonize them and then triangulate the reality underneath them is there are no data that, that support that at all. This is imposing uh, assumptions upon the text to make them fit and then to say, and here's how we can make it fit our own worldview in terms of is where they really just chattel or some other uh, form of property in perpetuity, or can we find a way to, you know, set them free to suggest that they are really uh, morally a little more uh, on the level we would like them to be. And so we have to fabricate this notion that, oh yeah, if we take this passage over here, we can put these two together and we can say, well, they must have been allowed to have converted and if they did convert, then they must have been allowed to be freed from slavery. And, and I think that's one of the roots yeah. of apologetics is begin from a conclusion and then rationalize your way back to whatever data you can find. Yeah, and, and th yeah. this, you touch on it there, like this idea of um, once they convert, I mean, what that sounds like to me, and I think that's what you were getting at, uh, Dan, is that um, if you look at Leviticus 25, everybody, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's an Israelite that, and they don't go into s s like servitude, right? That the text is very explicit. You can't keep a fellow Israelite as a slave. Um, you have to treat them as the, the Sahir, the, the hired worker. Uh, but at the period of at the time of the Jubilee at that 50th year, uh, then everybody goes back to their landed property, right? Then to make the, the, the leap, it's again, it's what it sounds like he's doing. And I, I can't get inside his head, so I don't know. Um, but the way that that comes across to me is that, well, if somebody converts, which like scholars, I, I, I again, not my area of expertise, but scholars, you know, that, that they don't, they don't argue for things like there's this idea of proselytization or, you know, outright conversion in that yeah, sense that, I was, that we think about it. Yeah. I was going to ask actually, if, if either of you know, uh, what we have, what sort of information and sources we have with regards to even the idea of conversion uh, from this period, if there's anything. There, there are a couple of references to circumcision, and that, but I yeah. don't know that that constitutes conversion because the notion of conversion treats the this framework, this legal and social framework, as having an ideological kind of dimension. Yeah. When really this was about ethnicity, this was about nationalism, this yeah. was about um, dissent, 
all mm -hmm. these things are not things that that are communicable. Um, and so once you get into Second Temple um, period and Greco-Roman period, that's when there's a little more pluralism. And now you've yeah. got to wrangle with, well, how do yeah. we make this happen? And circumcision seems to be one of the primary identity markers that you can, uh, a, a proselyte can take upon themselves. But in early periods like this, there is no indication whatsoever that they understood this concept of yeah. Israelitism, Judahitism, Judaism, or whatever, in anything remotely approximating the way we understand it today. And this is like, this is really what's missed too, right? When uh, apologists like, Dr. Falk throw these uh, these ideas out there. His audience, and he's taking for granted this too. I think that his audience already has a mental framework about what what conversion means, what it looks like. It's it's like the the ancient Israelite version of becoming a Christian, and and those are the sorts of uh, leaps, I guess, anachronistic leaps that you see so common that requires so much more uh, study and work that I, I just often don't don't see in uh, in these types of responses. I was just going to say, there's an edited volume that came out. I, I think it's like a 2010, 2011. Achenbach is, is one of the editors, and it's about the foreigner. It's got foreigner in the title. I, I can't remember um, specifically, foreigner but Bruce Wells. Wall. Yeah. Bruce Wells has a phenomenal article in there about the quasi alien in Leviticus twenty five. Um, oh, nice! Of course, I think I think everything Bruce Wells writes is brilliant, it's, but it's um, pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. There's a yeah, there's an article in there um, where, and I can't remember who wrote it, but it's talking about this process of how the gear develops, and there's lots of discussion, lots of different articles in there about you know the different types of foreigners and the relationships between them and. The differences between them and looking at it right now, this might be Achenbach's article. Gare, yeah. Nakhri, Toshav, Tsar, legal and so sacral distinctions regarding foreigners in the Pentateuch. There's one all the way at the end. Resident and, aliens and natives in the holiness legislation. Is that yeah. Okay, that's and, Christoph Niha. And, oh. and, and and there are a couple others, but one of the things that like shows up in the volume when you look through it, like you see that the Gare. He, they, they go through with you know in some detail laying out what it is that's that's going on with the gear in particular and what we see is that very specifically there are certain things that the gear was expected to do the resident was expected to do from a from a civic standpoint like you know when we talk about there's to be one law you know for the for the resident alien and the, and the native born the foreigner and the native born um like that that's not this all inclusive everybody's the same thing there are specific aspects it's it's very much context driven and so like there are aspects in in these uh these early, you know these texts that that uh in the pentateuchal text that describe all right here's what they have to do but here's what they don't have to do right they don't have to adhere to these certain religious things they don't have to slaughter the animal in this particular way um, and it's very nuanced and you have to really think about it. So this idea that there's this like overt conversion because they, they sacrifice to Yahweh or something, and then they become mm -hmm. an Israel. I mean, this is just really problematic just from a landed property standpoint, right? The whole point of the Jubilee is not just to free them. It's to free them to go back to their ancestral property. Ancestral. Yeah. So if they don't have that, you know, there's th that's why Leviticus 25, 44 to 46 makes this strong distinction. It's just very nuanced and very complicated. Yeah, I think one of the one of the things that I've I've talked about this in in other contexts, but one of the things that most a more conservative adherent to a religious tradition does with a sacred text is there's a constant process of renegotiation between the sacred past, and so this is what's going on in this. <clears throat> performance for the folks who are sending in these questions it's to say, here's how we can negotiate with this past in order to inform our present, in order to uh, to suggest that our group is doing it right, our community is on the right path, and in order to give meaning to our experiences. And with a an audience that are not specialists, you can't really go into phenomenal detail um, about you know, these laws over here are saying this and that and the other. That's, that's not really 
helping in the purpose of, of that renegotiation. And so you've got to use terms and concepts and frameworks that are already have purchase within the community, which is why this is not going to be complex. It's going to be, you know how we already know this and we already know this. And now here's a spot for us to plug this in right here. And now everything makes sense. And it resonates with the with the members of our community, and it's and then you know we can move forward from there, and we're all edified and and um, mm. uplifted by this whole experience. It's a it's a performative kind of communal, almost ritual kind of thing where we are we are right. convincing ourselves that we have it right, and that we are a part of this grand narrative, and we are carrying it forward. Right. I do have some 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 thoughts here, and I and I do see sometimes the whole matter of slavery in the Old Testament mischaracterized. It is not necessarily a permanent state of affairs, like we do find in say other forms of slavery. We also don't find say a lot of chattel slavery also in say he in Israelite culture. One is not necessarily free to resell slaves in 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 among say other Hebrews. So it's not property in the same way as having like gold or silver or anything like that, where it's instantly interchangeable. But we do have here a semantic range where the term property is just means that the, the slave master owns the slave, but he is not exactly free to do anything with him either. The Israelite culture is probably the only culture in the ancient Near East where According to, say, verse 20, if a slave dies, then the slave owner is punished. You know, it's it's the only only culture where that that takes place. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just yeah. read this. And again, this is such a complex issue because there are so many layers to the questions that we're asking. Right. If we're just asking the question, what shows up in law collection A from the ancient Near East and what shows up in law collection B in the Hebrew Bible and we, you know make the comparison, fine, we can do that. But like, as you know, you guys were pointing out earlier, you know, like what, what was actually practiced, what actually happened on the ground are these utopian ideas of these later idealistic things, or I'll read this. This is from Martha Roth's book on uh, law collections in ancient Mesopotamia and Asia Minor. Uh, but this is the laws of Hammurabi in uh, law. It was 115. If a man has a claim of grain or silver against another man, distrains a member of his household, and the distrainee dies a natural death while in the house of her or his distrainer, that case has no basis for a claim. So if somebody owes a debt, the guy that is owed the money goes and takes a person to, uh, to hold as a slave and utilize the labor to work off that payment um, and to maybe force the hand of the person that owes the money. And that slave, that distrainee dies during that period uh, there is no, a natural death, then there's no cause for a claim. 116, if the distrainee should die from the effects of a beating or other physical abuse while in the house of her or his distrainer, the owner of the distrainee shall charge and convict his merchant. And the, if the distrainee is the man's son, they shall kill his, uh, sorry, his, the distrainer's son. If the man's slave shall weigh out and deliver 20 shekels of silver, moreover, he shall forfeit whatever he originally gave as the loan. It's it's not that there's this like one-to-one -one comparison. You have something similar uh, in the laws of Veshnuna. The point is though that the legal rationale is similar. So if you read people like Samuel Gringus or Raymond Westbrook or Bruce Wells, I mean, really even uh, somebody like um, Richard Averbeck has an article in Behind the Scenes in the Old Testament uh, Fantastic little article. A couple of things I disagree with Richard Everbeck, but I, you know, it's okay. But I mean, this is this is just sort of standard procedure. You know, the, the, the laws in the Hebrew Bible are just not, on the whole, so different. There are obviously differences among the different legal collections in the ancient Near East, but there's sort of this overarching, you know, way of thinking about the law, and and very often even the the punishments themselves are very very similar, and the way that they're dealt with very very similar. So. Any any type of statement like this, where oh, this is the only place that we see this. Um, I mean, there might be a nuanced aspect to it, but on the whole, uh, this is actually pretty common. This this sort of thing. It's uh, it's it's part of the way that they thought about law and jurisprudence. Yeah, they're all drawing from the same sociocultural matrix. They're just situational 
differences as they get shown through their specific little uh, filters and lenses that they're using. But um, it's uh, the roots are the same. And that's absolutely yeah. not like a fringe position. That's not like me talking. Uh, you know, that's that that that's just what scholars that's say. The field. That work in yeah. This. yeah, that's the field. Because I, I yeah. wouldn't say it otherwise. And may, maybe to finish this this question up here, it's also pretty important to point out that uh, the legislation that we read in all of these texts is not necessarily a reflection either of the boots on the ground practice of these things. And I think I've heard you, uh, Dr. Josh, make this comment before, even with regards to uh, antebellum American slavery, that what happened uh, was very often, you know, not what was reflected in the actual laws uh, that were that were on the books. Yeah, and of course, it's so complex with the ancient Near East because these law collections it's still debated what they actually were, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the idea used to be that these are just this is normative, right? This is uh, this this is legislative, um, and of course, that's that's very it's a very minor position now. Uh, it's much more complex. I don't think there's any settled position, but it's it's not that this is like. Hammurabi propagating the law. It's all right now. This is now normative because I've put it on the steely or something, or the judges yeah. are sitting there, you know, all right, I got a case in front of me. Now, what am I supposed to do here? Let me, one seventeen. Okay, so here's what I'm supposed to do. Like, that's, that's not how these things are thought of, so. I think we have to be very, very circumspect about the role of slavery, its economic impacts, um, and and for example, even its redemption. There there are times when in in Hebrew culture where if a slave is set free, loves his master, he's got the option of remaining the master's slave through being a bond servant. So in that way, slavery is actually redeemed in Israelite culture. There are times when it's sometimes better to be a slave than just do your own affairs, knowing you're going to muck it up. It's, it's one of those things that I think we have to be very, very careful and circumspect. And I think a lot of, um, a lot of um, commentaries have, you know, done this topic injustice, really. So I agree with several of the things that he said, right? The idea of being very nuanced and circumspect about this. The flavor, if I can call it that, of what came across to me and what he said was that it's not so bad. Right. That's mm -hmm. how that that's how that came across to me, whether he intended that or not. That's how that came across. And that's a very it's a very apologetic way of looking at it. And yeah. the, the problem is that like we're not left to guess in the biblical text whether it was a good thing, like good, not like from a moral standpoint, but like a beneficial thing to be a slave or not to be a slave. Right? We're not left to guess. It's a life of drudgery. Right. The reason that, you know, what he's referring to here in Exodus 21 uh, and in Deuteronomy 15, you know, where it talks about if a if a, a male slave uh, goes in and he uh, that the context here is that while he's in, in in his six years of debt servitude, the master gives him a wife mm -hmm. and they have children. When he goes free, the wife and the children are chattel slaves. They don't go free, and so now the guy's faced with the decision: Do I? go free, ex exercise my right to of release, but I don't get to take my wife and children with me, or do I sign up for chattel slavery, yeah. right? And and it's, he's absolutely right. There's no question about it, that there are certain circumstances, maybe many circumstances, if you think about the prospect of a debt slave, they've just spent six years in the best circumstance, that we see in the Hebrew Bible, if they were even released, you know, think about Jeremiah 34, Nehemiah 5, you know, but they've just spent all this time not doing things for themselves. They've been doing it for somebody else. So now they're going to get turned loose. This is why in Deuteronomy 15, when it says, all right, we're, we're, we're redoing this a little bit, right? We're going to develop this a little bit. When you release them, you got to give them all these provisions. And that's so that Israel would be the head and not the tail and the people that are going out uh, having fallen into this economic, you know, hardship, they wouldn't just be going out as Dr. Falk says here to come back in, muck it up again, 
right? Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the reality. So I, that's absolutely true. I don't think though, that what that means is slavery is okay. And I, I don't think that he's saying that, but again, the flavor that's coming across here is it's the not so bad. Is certainly there. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and it is, you're right. This is a, uh, this is, this is common in, uh, in apologetic responses to these yeah. difficult questions about, about slavery. Yeah. So, but I think we can, uh, we could probably leave that one alone at this point and uh, move on to, uh, to the next question. I've heard Mark S. Smith say that Deuteronomy 32, 8 to 9 is evidence that Old Testament religion was polytheistic because it says that all El gave Israel to Yahweh. What are your thoughts on this argument? All right, well, let's look at Deuteronomy 32, 8 to 9. And we have to understand here that uh, Deuteronomy 32 is a bit of a weird passage. There's a there is a lot of reference in Deuteronomy 32 to um, to other forms of literature. There is some borrowing here, so we got to sort of keep that in mind that as we read this. So I'll start, I'll start at verse seven. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of all generations. Ask your father, and he will inform you. Your elders, and they will tell you. So that's po poetic right there. There's a doublet right in there. That's that's a nice doublet, by the way. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of man, he set the boundaries of the, uh, the number of the sons of, uh, of Israel. For the Lord's portion, this is Yahweh's portion, is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. Okay. The <clears throat> and I, I was just curious as he was reading what translation he's using. It looks like this is the NASB. Uh, okay. The yeah, I Standard. wondered myself. Yeah. And this is something that he never talks about. And I was curious the first time I watched this if he was going to pick up on this. But the entire reason that Mark Smith has been publishing on this for 20 years is because there is a variant reading at the end of verse 8 that most more conservative Bible translations ignore. And this is found in Septuagint manuscripts uh, in a couple different ways. And then we actually have uh, Qumran manuscripts that verify the hypothesized source that scholars have uh, posited based on the Septuagint reading. So the very end it says, um, and I'll go from what he's reading of uh, verse 8. He set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. So in the Septuagint, we don't have sons of Israel. We have two different readings. Uh, the minority reading, but likely earlier, Huion Theu, the sons of God or the children of God, more common is Angelon Theu, the angels of God. And scholars long known that Septuagint translators like to translate the Hebrew B'nai Elohim children of God, sons of God, with angels of God. So, And this, the, this is a reflection of, of uh, a, a second temple ideological development, which is taking place at the time that the, uh, the Greek texts themselves are being translated. Right. This um, kind of the other deities of the pantheon are kind of yeah. being shoved down and marginalized, and you're all angels now. And, but we're going to name you, we're going to give you jobs, you're going to have responsibilities, but you're all angels. So all these different things, the seraphim, the cherubim, all these different things, all shoved down to be an angels. Now, yeah. um, what it says basically in Deuteronomy 32.8 is reflected in another passage from a later time period, but Deuteronomy 4.19, when it talks about when you look up and you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all the host of heaven, um, you know, don't bow down to them. They were, Adonai gave them to the nations uh, to worship. And there's a bunch about don't worship the gods of the nations the way that they do. Um, but this is an earlier reflection of the idea that El Elyon distributed the nation according to the number of the children of God. The idea here being however many children of God there were, they split up all the nations and they each were distributed a nation. And then in the next verse, it says in Adonai's portion was uh, his people, Jacob, his inherited portion. Yeah. Um, and so what, what Mark Smith has been arguing is, and, and his 
perspective has become nuanced over the years. 2001, if you look at Origins of Biblical Monotheism, his, the idea is uh, that this reflects a distinction between Elyon and Adonai. The movement from verse 8 to verse 9 suggests Elyon distributed the nations to the B'nai Elohim, and Adonai's portion was Israel. Um, he has, I think, softened his perspective in, in more recent years. If you look at 2004, The Memoirs of God, 2008, God in Translation, um, I don't remember another publication from the last decade on this, but the idea is, is that this is an author who's trying to take a much older piece of tradition. That's why the previous verse says, ask your fathers, ask your ancestors, they'll tell you X. And is uh, he's suggesting that within Deuteronomy 32, Elion is identified with Adonai already, um, but we still have this idea that the nations are distributed to the children of God. And we find this idea that all the deities' purviews are limited to the boundaries of their own people or nations yeah. throughout, well, in, in primarily in pre-exilic literature. And this is one of the big problems of the exile. How can we sing the songs of Adonai in a foreign land? Because if you look at earlier stuff, Saul's chasing David. He's close to the borders. He's going to run him out of Israel. And he says, you're forcing me to worship other gods. Mm -hmm. Naaman returns to Syria. He takes two cartloads of Israelite soil with him so that he can worship Adonai outside of the nation. And then we have Judges 11, uh, the idea that you keep what your deity Chemosh has given to you. We're going to keep what our deity Adonai has given to us. This is consistently in the pre-exilic literature, this is the worldview. Yeah. Deuteronomy 32.8 reflects this because we have that variant reading. We know that was the original yeah. reading. And, and it does not strike me that Dr. Falk is at all aware of this discussion that has been raging for 20 it's, years. It's rather surprising watching through this entire s section of his video, his, his Q&A video, where he's addressing questions and speaking from a position of authority and expertise on the Bible that he seems absolutely blissfully unaware of the textual issues uh, that come to bear on this passage. And maybe this is this is the time for me to, I've got a good visual um, which illustrates basically what's going on here, a careful appraisal of the Hebrew texts themselves shows a distinct progression from polytheism towards monotheism. And this passage from Deuteronomy 32, 8 to 12, that Dr. Dan mentioned retains an obvious reflection of a polytheistic worldview. Here's a photograph of the fragment of 4Q Deuteronomy J, which contains the passage in question. 4Q Deuteronomy J dates back to the mid-first century CE, and while it is not the oldest manuscript copy of the book of Deuteronomy, it does retain the earliest physical evidence of this crucial reading. In the passage, the chief god of the region, El Elyon, is pictured dividing the territory amongst the council of gods. When Elyon apportioned the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the people according to the sons of God, or maybe even the gods. In the following verse, Israel's tribal deity Yahweh is distinguished from the chief god, Elyon. Thus, Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob, the region of his hereditary property. So there is an obvious problem for both monotheism and the insistence on exclusivity of Yahweh's divinity in this passage. And we can trace how Jewish scribes handle the matter. In the Septuagint, the Greek translator rendered the Hebrew construction B'nai Elohim, sons of God, into Angelon Theo, the angels of God. By the time of the Hellenistic period, it had become commonplace to reimagine the lower members of the Canaanite pantheon as angels and not actual gods. The form of the passage that most are familiar with, appears in the Masoretic text. This is the version of the Hebrew Bible that the post-temple rabbinic Jews adopted as their standard text. 
parts of the MT were clearly already in circulation before the 2nd century BCE, but the oldest manuscript copies stem from after the 3rd century. The MT rendition of this problematic passage was to change B'nai Elohim to B'nai Yisrael, thus rendering the sense of this ideology into nonsense. This is the passage that is clearly unknown to Dr. Falk and which he reads in his response. When Elion apportioned the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the people according to the sons of Israel. For Yahweh's portion is his people Jacob, the region of his hereditary property. Thanks to the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint, we see a clear line of development from polytheistic Israel, where the tribal god Yahweh was a member of El Elyon's Council of Deities, to the Septuagint, where the council was replaced by angels, to the MT, where the angels were omitted altogether. But there is more. So this fragment, 4Q Deuteronomy 2, which dates to the mid-1st century BCE, and like 4Q Deuteronomy J, survives as the oldest copy of Deuteronomy 32, but preserving only verses 41 to 43, and these look different from our biblical texts. The English translation most of us are accustomed to is derived from the later Masoretic text, which has eliminated and changed critical portions of the passage. The MT reads, Sing praises nations for his people. For the blood of his servants he will avenge. He will wreak vengeance on his enemies and cleanse the land of his people. The altered portions are highlighted in red. From the earlier text, a stanza is missing. Bow down before him, all you gods. The following line has been changed from Yahweh's vengeance on behalf of his sons to his servants, thus glossing over a polytheistic view of the divine counsel. There is another missing stanza appearing at the end of the passage. He will repay those who hate him. The reasons for these changes is rather obvious from both clear perspectives of the development of monotheistic ideals in Israel and later Jewish religion, and of the nature of Hebrew poetry. The original form of the passage is in three pairs of parallel statements. Praise, O heavens, his people, bow down before him, all you gods, for he will avenge the blood of his sons and take vengeance on his adversaries. He will repay those who hate him and cleanse his people's land. For a later editor, the polytheistic essence of the second stanza prompted its omission, and the alteration of the object in the third stanza from blood of his sons to blood of his servants. But these changes also created an uneven poetic structure by also eliminating the fifth stanza. The entire poetical structure is improved and also changed into a chiastic grouping of four lines featuring people, vengeance, vengeance, and people. So it is clear from the manuscript evidence that monotheism is something that did in fact develop within early Judaism over time, and that latent forms of a developed polytheism continue to persist. But uh, I think at this point we can we can probably move on, gentlemen. All right, well, let's let him uh, say his piece. Yeah, let's do that. Now, if I look at the Hebrew here, um, I don't think um, I here's here's one thing here. I would I would doubt. I've got some big 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 doubts here that uh, Mark Smith is correct here because what we have here is another. We do actually have here a sort of another um, couplet, almost a chiasm. So we have on the outside of this sort of chiasm of this, uh, when the Most High gave the nations their, their inheritance. And then it's followed by when he separated the sons of man. And then the next couplet would be begins with, he set the boundaries of his people according to the number of the sons of Israel for the Lord's portion 
is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. Okay. So it's more or less not so much. It's not so much that Elion is giving it all out. And oh, here, Yahweh, have your share too. That's not what the text is saying. That's a really poor reading of the text. It's more uh, along the lines of, okay, here is the the division of the of the nations. Okay. But I am reserving one portion for myself. The Lord is dividing the peoples, but he is also saying there is one people that is special. One people that is set apart for his own purposes. It's not an argument for polytheism. It's not an argument for polytheism. Um, but it is an argument for saying that the Lord did divide the nations and that the Lord gave each nation their inheritance. All nations get their inheritance of land from God. We've already touched on this in, in, in Judges 11, when Jephthah messed up. And he, he says to, to, to his opponents, well, Chemosh gave you your land. No, he didn't. And this is the exact verse that tells us that God gives people their land, not some pagan god. And this is the exact verse which tells us how, when God did it. So I really think here that, that Mark Smith is taking, say, a source-critical um, approach to the text and basically saying, oh, you got Elion? You got Yahweh. It's two gods, obviously. No, he's wrong here. So obviously, Dr. Falk is not aware of what Mark Smith is actually arguing because the, the polytheism argument has less to do with the distinction of Elion from Adonai as it has to do with the fact that the nations are being distributed to the B'nai Elohim, the children yeah. of God, which can also be interpreted just to mean gods. If son of man, son of the prophets means a man and a prophet, then sons of God can mean just gods. So that's explicitly polytheistic if we accept that rubric of polytheism, monotheism. Um, and so obviously, uh, Dr. Falk is not aware of that. And then additionally, the understanding of what the inheritance was, he seems to suggest that the inheritance is the inheritance for the people. When the land is the deity's inherited land. Um, and this is nowhere in the text does it say this land is for the people. This is the land being given to the deities for their rule. Um, and it reflects precisely what's going on in Judges 11 because Chemosh has had that land given to him for him to yeah. now um, administer. And when if he goes into another land and conquers that, well, he's giving more land to his people. And so it fits perfectly within Judges 11 unless you need to force the, the round peg into the square hole by saying we, we cannot even allow that this is polytheistic. We've got to find a monotheistic reading, um, which does not pay attention to the details of the text. So this was um, yep. this was a, a reading that shows no awareness of the scholarship whatsoever and imagines a reading that has nothing to do with, with what Dr. Smith was has said for the last 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dan. And and, and I think that that really clearly sums up exactly what's wrong here. I just wanted to make one more point about Dr. Falk's response, where he, he suggests that Mark Smith is reading this from a source critical view. Uh, th this signals to me, and I've been critical, I've watched a few of uh, Falk's handlings of the documentary hypothesis, the theory of, uh, of, of sources behind uh, the Pentateuchal text. Um, and in everything that I've seen him do on this topic, it seems clear to me that he doesn't have a good understanding of how the theory even works. And this is just another example of this, because he looks at the text that he has, again, has no idea about the textual issues behind the reading, but then also suggests that Mark Smith's objection to this 
has to do with the use of the names El and Yahweh in separate verses. And he's and he's understanding that as as like an indication of a source theory model uh, applied to the text. And that absolutely has nothing at all to do with what's going on in this passage. But um, yeah, I think that's that's probably it for this. Um, you guys have anything else to uh, to say as we finish up here? No, I'm good. Thank you for having me on. This yeah, good. I appreciate it. Yeah. And thank you, Dan and uh, Josh, for joining me. Thank you, uh, viewers, for uh, joining us today. And uh, I really hope that uh, you found this both illuminating and insightful. It's important to remember from this that just because someone is claiming a level of expertise, this does not mean that he or she is always promoting this honestly. When it comes to the Bible, trust the actual biblical scholars before running to the Egyptologists. That's all for now. I'm Kip Davis.